want to go back and uh, just hit some highlights and springboard off of where I ended uh, last week in the message. If you remember, uh, we preached on the subject, the prison of expectation. And uh, we talked about how faith is an expectation and how uh, this expectation... Uh, it's contagious. We spoke about John the Baptist and, uh, and how he expected Jesus when he would come to be one way. But when he got here, uh, it was a little bit different for him. And, uh, you know, John the Baptist was in, in two prisons at the same time. Uh, he was in a physical prison that Herod Antipas had placed him in, but he was also in a prison. It was an invisible prison, and, it, and it, it, a prison that is well known, I believe, by the majority of us, and that is the prison of our expectations. And sometimes we expect certain things, and guess what? God doesn't answer the way that we expected Him to. In fact, when, when Jesus, uh, when He came uh, in John the Baptist's day, He came and, he, and basically it was, John the Baptist, I know that I am not doing the things that you thought I would do. I know that this time around I did not come uh, as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, but I come in grace. I come in mercy. And John, you're going to quickly learn that you need that grace and mercy before I come as King of kings and Lord of lords. He's, he, he, he said, John, for such a time as this, I come with grace. I come that many might be saved. That one of these days, I will return as King of kings, as Lord of lords, and I will be all of that that you had expected me to be the first time, but this time I'm coming in love, I'm coming in mercy, I'm coming in grace. And boy, church, aren't we thankful that the first time that He can't come, He did not come in power, He did not come in wrath, he did not come to make all things complete, but He came to give you and I a chance at knowing Him. It's good, isn't it? Uh, oftentimes, this can be applied to many areas of our life, the prison of our own expectations. We also talked last week about the way that God grows our faith is through disappointment of our own expectations. And if you are on that faith journey and you have been disappointed in your faith, just tie a knot and hang on. Because I promise you, God is going to show up when He needs to, where He needs to. He's never been late. He's always, always on time. And my last point uh, last week was, actually it came from uh, my awesome wife, uh, the uh, expectations is premeditated resentment. And I've been thinking about that all week, and I, uh, I want to turn that idea because I think that's where a lot of us find ourselves. We begin to resent things because we have an expectation, and oftentimes that expectation has not even been communicated. And, and we hold others, we hold our relationships captive by our expectations, and we don't even think about the fact that they don't even know what we expect but yet we want them to somehow arrive there. Huh. And when we do that, it really is a place of resentment. And I'd like to bounce off of that if I could this morning as we approach this text. And as we read it, you're going to say, Pastor, what are you, what are you talking about? Where, where is that Matthew chapter 6? Beginning in verse 31, it says, Therefore... Take no thought, saying, 
What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or whether with shall we be clothed, or wherewith we shall be clothed? Verse 32, for after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father, I like this part, underline it, highlight it, this is good, don't forget this. He says, for your heavenly Father, He knoweth that ye have need of all these things. He knows what you need before you even know that you need it. All right? Now, that was a good place for an amen, and you just blew it. All right? I know that we lost an hour of sleep. Trust me. I was over there on the front row, too, yawning a little bit, right? Trying to get my eyes open. Hopefully, some of you don't need a broomstick to hold your eyes open this morning. So, let's do this. Let's Everybody reach their hands to the heavens right now. All right? Husbands, this is a good place for you to get your hands up, and then when you, when you bring your hands down, guess what? You can let your hand rest right around your sweetheart and pull her in a little closer, right? Uh, honey, if I was sitting next to you, that's what I'd do right now, right? Yeah, Mr. Suavo. Get your hands up real quick, right? Let's get it stretched out. I know we didn't come for yoga today, but I want the blood flowing. All right, here we go. We're ready. I'm going to give you another go at that. Your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. He knows what you need before you even know that you need it. Amen. Amen. That's good. See, I told you I was a good place for an amen. Watch this, verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things. Things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Verse, now, I want you to notice something in my Bible. Chapter 7 begins, but I don't see any distance left between chapter 6 where it left off there in verse 34 and verse 1 of chapter 7. So I'm squishing them together, if that's okay. He says, judge not. Here we go. I'm giving those that don't even know Matthew wrote... Matthew, in the Bible, I, I'm, I, I'm going to speak their language right now for just a second, in context, where they use it out of context. Somebody say amen. Here we go. Judge not that ye be not judged. They love that, don't they? For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest, I love this, and why beholdest thou the moat? For those of you that might have a different translation, it might say speck. Let me tell you what that is. A moat, a piece of sawdust, okay? Just a speck of sawdust. And why beholdest thou the moat that is in Thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam. Structural. Large. Right here. The beam. In your own eye. Or why wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the moat... Out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is then I, is in thine own eye. Verse five: Thou hypocrite! First, cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Give not that which is holy. Unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls 
before the swine pigs, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. Verse 7, ask and it shall be given you, seek and ye shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. This morning I'm preaching for a few moments on the subject focus. Kristen had no idea that I was going to preach this message. I had no idea that Kristen was going to sing that song. But boy, how true it is. Turn your eyes to Jesus. What is your focus? Verse 33 tells us something. It tells us, align your heart with my heart and your plans with my plans. This is God speaking. Align your heart with God's heart. Align your plans with God's plans. And He will give you the rest of what the world is after. See that? You say, the world, what are you talking about? He says, the Gentiles. See it? It's in parentheses there. What they seek after. What the world longs for. What they want. What they're going after. And sometimes I know what it is to be a Christian. I see what's going on. And you, and you think in your mind, oh man, boy, it'd be, it'd be awesome to have just one more day to sleep in and not have to go to church. I've been there in my own life, right? But can I share with you something? If you seek ye first the things of God... All the things that you think you are missing. He will add to you and so much more. Let's dive in this morning as we focus together. Let me share with you this first point. You are in control of your focus. What you choose to focus on is your choice. No one else can manipulate. No one else can steal this from you. You have control over your focus. Now, there are many things in life that you don't have control over. But if we learn how, and if we learn that we are committed to it, we can have control of the things that we focus on. On. Two, many relationships fail, not because of a loss of love, but a loss of focus. In fact, do you realize that there are a lot of couples that seek after counseling because somewhere along the way they believe that they have fallen out or that they have lost the ability to love the person that God has given them to love. And the problem is, is it's, it's, it's not about a loss of love, it's about a loss of focus. Many relationships fail not because of the loss of love, but a loss of focus. In fact, that even bleeds into the church. Do you know churches can fail? Why? Because they lose their focus. If a church gets its focus on the people and not God, guess what? It's going down. I mean, if we were to become what everyone in this room expected... And we left out what God wanted. Guess what? That house is going to divide. That house is going to fall. That house will never receive the blessing that it needs to continue. Not just for today, but for eternity. Why? Because it's lost its focus. See, the focus of the church has to be on following Jesus. If you stop caring about what God cares about, we lose the blessing from God. And not only does that apply to the church, that applies to a marriage. In our marriages, if we get our eyes off of one another 
If we get our eyes on other things, if we get our, our heart set on other things, if we look at the problem all the time, guess what? You're never going to see a solution, friend. Somebody say, man, I'm preaching real good to us right now. It applies to our church. It applies to our marriage. It applies to our relationships. And you know what? The reality is, 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 is friendships and people, they come into our lives. They go out of our lives. They come into our lives. They go out of our lives. And you know what I love most of all? When you find that one person where they have come into your life for a season and they have gone out of your life for a season and they, they've come back for a season and gone out. But you know what? Every time you come back together, it's like they never were gone. That's a special friend that doesn't hold it against you because I haven't heard from... No. We've lost our focus. Are you with me? A relationship... Can I say this? You're going to love me here. Our jobs, our careers. You remember what it was when you first got that call that you got the job? I mean, you came to church and you praised Jesus that you got the job. Fast forward that about two years, you may not like your boss, you may not even like your job anymore, and guess what happened? We don't like our job, do we? Why don't we like our job? You were praising the Lord for your job two years ago because you didn't have one. Uh Uh-oh, we've arrived at something. What have we arrived at? Well, we've, here it is, bless you, we lost our focus. You see, when we didn't have our job, our focus was on what? Getting a job. And we got excited that we had one, but now that we got one, guess what? We wish we had a different one. See, focus, it bleeds not just in our church and marriages and relationships, but it even bleeds into our jobs, our careers, what we do. It's often not that it's failing, but it's out of focus. It's often not that your church is failing, it's out of focus. It's, it, it's not often that your marriage is failing, failing, but it's out of focus. Your relationships, it, it, it's, they've only failed if you have allowed them to fail. They might be a little out of focus, but guess what? They haven't failed. See, it's often not that it's failing, but it's out of focus. And I want you to see what this passage has to say in, in, in verse 3. Of chapter 7, it says, You seek. In, verse, in chapter 7 and verse 7, it says, Not only do you seek, but you, you ask, you find, you knock. And all of those things refer to what? You have to pay attention. You have to go after it. See, culture... Culture is broken. Why is culture broken? Well, it's unfocused. Let me give you an example of this, if you'll allow me to, for just a second. Uh, anybody love a good sitcom? I mean, there's plenty of them out there, right? And I, I, I know once you've exhausted what you thought was good on Netflix, you've got Facebook, right? That you, know, you text your, send that out to your friends, and they'll, they'll give you their opinions on what the, what the next show to watch. But have you ever noticed how sitcoms and movies, when it comes to relationships, it's always about falling in love. Can I ask a question? Why is staying in love not popular? But have you ever noticed that? All the sitcoms, all of the movies, they're all about falling in love. Why is that? Why is it all about falling in love? And here is why. Are you ready? Because falling in love is the exciting part. 
Falling in love is the fairy tale. I'll tell you why they don't have movies on staying in love. (laughs) Because it takes work and it's not glamorous. It doesn't sell tickets. Everybody wants to remember and, and watch people fall in love. Everybody wants the exciting part. And here's what happens. When it goes wrong in the staying in love, all of a sudden they believe, oh no, we we don't love each other. No, you're not focused on each other anymore. I mean, ladies, let's just face it. When he's in the bathroom and it's loud, Causes you to not focus on him. Thanks, babe. I know you love me. (laughs) How do I go on? Uh, But are you with me? Hey, guys, when she rolls over in the morning and that breath, that awesome, (laughs) wonderful breath. In fact, for some of us, we are so busy in life that there is not even a rollover and a glance in the morning. We're going 100 mile an hour. And see, it's not that you've fallen out of love, it's that you've fallen out of focus. I mean, everybody, every marriage knows it, that man, if we could just get away for a couple of hours. And most of us say, no, pastor, we need more than a couple of hours. When you get away and you're able to focus on one another, you begin to see things a little bit differently. Let me give you some points here to help us bring some things, I hope, into focus. Number one is your focus on finding or becoming. Is your focus on finding or becoming. In verse 33 it says, "Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you." But notice it says, "Seek first him." Jesus says, it's not Matthew, it's Jesus that said this. He says, "Seek ye first the kingdom of God." So may I submit to you that happiness is not finding the right person. Happiness is being the right person. And the author of that is unknown. Happiness is not finding the right person. Happiness is being the right person. Because here's the truth. If you find the right person and you are not the right person... What have you done to the poor right person? I've got half of you looking at me like deer in the headlights look because you don't understand. If you constantly are looking for the right person and you yourself are not the right person, guess what you do to the right person that enters into this relationship? What are you saying, Pastor? Here's what I'm saying. Is your focus on finding Or is your focus on becoming? You see, the only way to have the right people in your life is to first be the right person in your heart. Let's think of marriage for just a second. Marriage is not two half people that when they come together, they make a whole. In fact, when God put this in His Word in Genesis, I think it's chapter, uh, chapter 2, I believe it is, uh, where He says, husband and wife, they come together and the two shall be one. It doesn't say one half person and the other half person comes together and makes one person. No, that's not what it says. What does it say, Pastor? Well, it says that the two whole shall become one 
whole. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, two that come together that are more focused on becoming the right person instead of finding the right person, the relationship can then come together and be whole. Question, is your focus constantly on finding? Got to find the right girl, got to find the right guy. Once I think I've found the right one, got to find uh, the right ring, got to find the right place to propose, got to find the right dress, got to find the right bridesmaids, got to find the right florist, got to find the right location, got to find, got to find, got to find, got to find. And, and, and you know that our world is driven by finding. Our social media is driven by you finding what you want. Where is the nonsense and why can't we get rid of the finding and start learning to become? Because the way I read it in Genesis, and the two will become one. Focus point number two. Is your focus on then or is your focus on now? Look at verse 34 with me. Of chapter 6 it says, Take therefore no thought for the morrow. Don't think about tomorrow. For tomorrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Now notice with me. Is your focus on then or is your focus on now? He tells us right there, don't focus on tomorrow. Well, why not focus on tomorrow? Why not focus on yesterday? Uh, in, in fact, you and I both know that one of the problems with our focus is this. We live in the past. We get hung up on the past. We get hung up on the way they treated us. We get hung up on the way that we were raised. We get hung up on we didn't have this and we didn't have that. Whether that past is positive or whether that, uh, uh, that past is negative, what happens is, is we try to focus on the past. And we bring the past into our present, don't we? Oh, why didn't he call me back today? Why didn't he text? Why, why didn't he respond? And, I'm, and, and all of a sudden the past comes into the present and, and paranoia sets in and, and all of a sudden there's expectations that fly out. And, and how about this? Maybe it's, not posi- maybe it's negative, but maybe it's positive things. Maybe, well, I, I always dreamed that it would be this way or that way. We live in the past. He says don't live in the past. He also says don't live in the future. You know what happens when you live in the future? It's all about dreaming. You ever thought about that? In fact, Annie penned it best when she sang the song, Tomorrow, tomorrow, I'll love you tomorrow. Wouldn't it have been funny if she'd have stepped out and said, Today, today. Wouldn't have made the same sense, would it? You see, when we put things into tomorrow, it always carries an idea. It always carries with it a dream. It always carries with it an expectation. So let me ask you again, is your focus on then or is your focus on now? See, I'm of the opinion that If you need something, if you want something, guess what? God can give it to you right now. 
In fact, if you're sitting here this morning and you're away from God and you, you want to be right with God, you don't even have to wait till the end of the message. You could get up right now. You could come down to an altar's prayer. And guess what? You could get that done now. Focus point number three. Is your focus on what is not or on what you got? Two important things when it comes to relationships, and this is any relationship that is intimate. And what I mean by that is not a sexual connotation at all. I just mean an intimate, close, caring relationship. It could be, it, I hope it's with your spouse. It's definitely, hopefully, with your kids. How about a parent? Mom, dad, maybe a grandpa. Maybe it is a friend. But I'm talking about those relationships, any relationship that's close. <coughs> Tool number one, if you are going to change the focus, is this. And I want you to see it for me, uh, uh, with me. In verse 3 of chapter 7, in verse 4 of chapter 7, and verse 5 it talks about a moat in someone's eye. A speck. A small, hard-to-see piece. In fact, it's so small that you need one of these to be able to see it. You know what happens when you see specks in other people's eyes, the first thing that you've got to be is close to them. <laughs> right? I mean, if I'm going to see a speck in my brother's eye, I've got to be right up in his stuff. In fact, I'm going to be so close, he's going to be like, Pastor, really? Do you get it though? You, you've got to be close to them. And, and, and what happens is, is, is we magnify something about them. And what happens is, is when, when our relationships are not exciting anymore, are not glamorous anymore, I mean, let's just, just face it, our relationships are filled with dirty diapers, bottle changes, work, extracurriculars. I mean, Johnny is in ball and, and Sarah is in dance. And I just pulled those names out of thin air. I'm not pointing to anybody in the room. But what happens is, is at a distance, we begin to use a magnifying glass. And what happens is, is, is we stop magnifying what we got. And we magnify what is not. What do you mean? Well, you know, guys, when you first met her, she was... She was so smart. You didn't realize then that that turned into she's got a good memory. She remembers all of the wrong things that you have done. I got some heads shaking right now. I, I, somebody relates. I mean, guys, when she was funny, it made you laugh until you became the center of the funny. And she was laughing at you. I mean, she was beautiful until you realized the cost. <laughs> oh, Lord, help us. I got one more. Hey, ladies, 
I mean, you thought he was the most laid back guy until you learned that laid back was abbreviated lazy. Watch it. I heard him too, though. See, here's the truth. What you magnify, you get more of. What you focus on, you get more of. Here at your church, if you seek, you will find. Do you remember when you first came to church, you were seeking after something? And you longed for something. And I've heard people say this, Pastor, you, well, I mean, you preached right at me. And I even came back the second week, and my goodness, are, are you somewhere in the house? No, I'm not. Why is it like that? Because you came seeking. You were looking for Him. You were looking for something. You were longing for it. And now that you've been here and you've received what you were looking for, guess what? You've stopped magnifying it. The very thing that we need, we've stopped magnifying it. Do you realize that, ladies, you have so much control over that man? And I don't know if you're using that for, for, for harm or if you're using that for good. Guys, let's just face it. When, 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 when the car pulls in and there's groceries, I mean, I love those plastic bags. I mean, I can fit probably ten of them. I, you know, one on every finger. And I walk into the house and I'm like, yeah. And you know what makes me even put one under my chin or in my mouth the next trip? Is when she goes, man, how do you do that? You're so strong. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to pour it on. Mm, I'm going to put one in my mouth now. And... <laughs> do you realize, ladies, that you have that kind of power? Ladies, you hold within your tongue and within your heart the ability to make a man bigger and stronger in just seconds. And men, she doesn't need you to fix her. She just needs us to love and appreciate her. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church. So let me ask you a question. Do you magnify what is not? Or do you magnify what you got? I mean, are you constantly up in their grill trying to find the imperfection? Or are you standing back? Looking at all of what God has given you in front of you. Are you trying to find the fault or are you looking beyond the fault and focusing on the person that he gave you? And becoming the person that he wants you to be. Focus point number four. I promise I'm getting close. How many of you have noticed that in that verse, it talks about a moat, it talks about a beam? Maybe in your translation, it's a speck or a log. Do you ever notice that uh, both of those things are, are made out of the same substance? In fact, the beam is nothing more than sawdust all put together. So you say, Pastor, what, 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 am, what are you saying? What I am pointing out is already, if I'm pointing the speck out in somebody else's eye, it's because I'm noticing something that is already in me. Focus point number four. Is your focus... What is theirs? Or is your focus what is mine? 
And that requires a different tool. Not a magnifying glass, but a mirror. Because you and I both know it's so much easier to carry this around. And find fault in everyone around us. But what about, what about this tool? Is your focus on what is theirs or is your focus on what is yours? You see, when you carry a mirror around, it's about, it's about looking at yourself. And in fact, isn't that what Jesus is saying? He says, And why beholdest thou the mote, the small particle of dust, in your brother's eye, in your spouse's eye, in your, in your church, in your co-worker's eye, in that boss that you don't like? Why beholdest the mote, that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in your own. You see, most of us would be so much better. Most of us would be so much happier. Most of us would be so much at peace if we would stop using the magnifying Glass to point out everyone's fault and failure. And we would pick up a mirror and see our own fault and failure. I don't know if you've learned this yet, but I'm going to help you. I can't change them, but here's what I can change. I can change me. If you're focused constantly on the expectation you have and the outcome that you believe, you completely lose sight of what needs to happen in you. I'm going to close like this. Notice with me verse 7 of chapter 7. It says, Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Ask, seek, knock. And maybe for some of you sitting here this morning, right here is where it needs to start. And it has to start focusing on you. Maybe you got to stop wishing and hoping that they will change. And maybe you're the one that needs to change. In fact, when I read that verse, there's some sirens and some alarms that go off. There's some things that point to another passage of Scripture. Ask, seek, knock. And it points me honestly to Revelations chapter 3 and verse 20. Where Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He says, If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Do you want to know where focus begins? Focus begins with you and God. Focus begins with the question, what are you going to do with Jesus? Because here's what I know. He stands at the door of your heart. And he knocks. And the first step to focusing your life is to listen
and to hear the knock. And when you hear the knock, you open the door. That is the door of your heart. And you ask Jesus to come in. And when he comes in, he, behold, he can make all things new. And notice what it says. He doesn't just visit. He stays. If you'll let him, he'll stay. If there are some things in your life that you need to focus on, if there are some things in your life that you have magnified that have not become healthy in your relationships, can I ask you something this morning? Can I ask you just to put the magnifying glass down and pick up a mirror and see yourself? Every head's bowed and every eye's closed. No one's looking on here this morning. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man, any man, Hear my voice and open the door. I will. I won't think about it. I won't wait a minute. I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Can I ask you again this morning, what is your focus? Every head's bowed, every eye's closed, no one's looking on. If right now you hear the knock, you know that he is speaking to you all I want to do is pray with you I'm asking you right now just slip up your hand with me and say by that pastor he's knocking just slip it up with me take it right back down you've never given your heart completely to the Lord Jesus you've never opened the door to your heart and invited him to come in I'm asking you right now just slip up your hand with me and say by that Pastor, would you pray for me? Anyone at all in the building? Anyone at all? Maybe you're here this morning and maybe something has gone south. Maybe something has gotten off. Maybe there has been a distraction. Maybe you are not focused the way that you remember. Maybe even in your marriage, you're struggling to focus. Maybe in your church, maybe in your relationships, maybe even with your job. If the Lord is speaking to you this morning, just slip up your hand with me and say by that, Pastor, would you pray for me? God bless you. Others this morning, just slip it up. Take it right back down. God bless you. I see it. So does God. Someone else. I'll ask you again. What is your focus? Father in heaven, speak to our hearts right now, we pray. I ask you, Lord Jesus, to be near us. I pray, Lord, that you will just speak to us. And Lord, if 
someone needs to come this morning and give their life to you, if someone needs to come this morning and be refocused on you, I pray that they will have liberty right now to do that. Help them help us in Jesus' name. And amen. As we stand together quietly, as this song of invitation plays, I'm inviting you right now. What is your day? God bless you. God bless you. Ladies of Lighthouse, would you come and pray with her? Celebrate what God is doing. Someone else, he's speaking. He's speaking to you. He's whispering, he's he's knocking. Don't turn him away. Don't push him aside. Don't try to just don't try to push it off. Receive what he's got for you today. Someone else just slip out of your seat and come, come on. Come on. Let us celebrate with you. Think of this. If it's in your heart, you hear the knock. If it's in your heart, you hear the pounding. You feel it. If He is speaking to you, watch this. He has decided to leave heaven today to speak to you. We celebrate that with you. Don't be ashamed of that. Grab hold of that. Let us celebrate with you. If he's speaking to you, why don't you come? Come on. Anyone else? Come on. Come on. Anyone else this morning? You need to come. What's your focus? else this morning you need to come maybe a husband and wife need to join hands together and say let's go get focused let's stop trying to be together as halves let's go get whole and be together as one let's get focused Let's get focused. Do you need to come today? We want to celebrate with you. If he's speaking, why don't you come?